cool. Yeah, we should have a good audience here today. Hey guys, okay. Let's see, I already got the echo going. Hey, what's up everybody in YouTube land? Let me share actually the Telegram group that we're going live and I'm gonna hit record in a second. We have the great Tom Cowan with us today. Gonna be a good one. Let's see here. Hey y'all, uh, give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. Uh, Mike, by the way, could you hear me? Is Mike? Sound yeah. okay? Yeah, you both okay. sound good. <clears throat> okay. Do it. I'm going to hit record. Not going lie, going live. Anything but lies today. Okay, guys, let's do it. And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here as always with the champion of permaculture and biogeometry, Dr. Bear Lando, making waves again in Instagram. Spreading. Boy, did we trigger amazing. some people with that, huh? <laughs> so, yes, Tom, uh, a... you know, we have Shannon here on the property. She follows me around with the camera sometimes. So we're planting a tree, and I was doing a biogeometry thing, and and boy, it just brought the trolls out of the woodwork. So uh, it was it was great fun. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, Mike. Sorry to interrupt. No worries. Coming live from the great state of Jefferson, where freedom still reigns supreme here on the Smith River. It's uh, middle of summer, and it's been a cool summer so far. Plants are loving it. I am not so much loving it at the river. I mean, it, I'm going to the river every day, but it's not the typical really hot days. Uh, it's been a nice mid seventies every day, almost typically we're in the mid eighties. So been an interesting summer. Um, but Hey, I appreciate every minute I get to live here. So, uh, thank you, mother nature for delivering all that you do here. Uh, we're with the great Tom Cowan today, going to go deep into everything he's doing with the new biology uh, clinic and his new platform uh, and um, bringing truth and light to the peoples out there, as he always does. Uh, the end of COVID launched on Tuesday uh, to great acclaim so far, nothing but rave reviews. If you wanna see how much effect it's having, go on Twitter and just search theendofcovid.com and see all the posts. It's really the only thing I've ever known to go viral, uh, truly viral in that sense, because uh, people are uh, really in tune with this stuff. I think uh, it's very exciting to see terrain information like this reaching the masses. So shout out to Alex Zek and the whole team uh, doing that. Also, um, the Biggelsons Bear just launched their uh, second season of their Terrain Academy, I believe they're calling it, or Terrain University. So uh, definitely go check that out. Those guys are doing amazing work. Uh, and of course, Music and Sky is almost a month away now. That is the Terrain Hangout of the year. Uh, Don Lester, David Parker, Amanda Vollmer, Bear Lando, Kelly Brogan, uh, uh, Alex Zek, uh, you name it, go down the line. Uh, I, Hannah Maria is coming now. Um, uh, God, so many amazing souls are going to be there in person, hugging and dancing and celebrating life. So, uh, if you haven't checked that out yet, musicandsky.com. Anything else, Bear, before we bring Tom on? No, um, this, I just want to get into it. Uh, you know, I, I said last week, you know, Josh Biggleson was here. And we had a great time uh, in between looking at stuff on the uh, microscope. We're looking at everybody's blood here and going into the holographic blood work uh, pretty deep. Uh, I had him digging holes out in, the, out in the yard there. So I took advantage of him a little bit. So we had a great visit and, uh, you know, having a great discussion with Adam Biggleson the other day uh, as well. We were really wanting to integrate uh, Alpha Vedic, our platform with the Biggleson Academy. And as our new membership site is launched, we're going to have a lot of interplay between the two sites so that uh, members can talk to the Biggelsons, talk to us, vice versa. And then I believe I'm going to be on one of their uh, 
first episodes in their new season there. So great folks and have a lot to share. And what we're trying to do is keep the old knowledge alive. Um, you know, uh, you know, that, uh, their dad started and this brings us right smack into today's talk with, uh, Tom, because, uh, it's about the new biology, which is actually old school knowledge. And, but Tom will be able to explain it better. So why don't you finish our intro and we'll get into it, Mike. Sure. On this episode, Dr. Tom Cowan is here to share the new biology initiative and his quest to bring common sense to holistic family wellness. Quote, it is called new biology because the, quote, old biology, based as it is on germ theory, genetic theory, cell theory, and a whole lot of other unproven or disproven hypothesis, is the wrong place to start a medical practice. Dr. Thomas Cowan is a well-known alternative medicine doctor, author, and speaker with a common sense holistic approach to health and wellness. Quote, we are launching our new biology clinic to give people access to the healing philosophies, strategies, and yes, even the details that I have come to in my 40 plus years in medicine. Tom has given countless lectures and workshops throughout the U.S. on a variety of subjects in health and medicine and is the author of seven books. Recent publications include Breaking the Spell, The Scientific Evidence for Ending the COVID Delusion, The Contagion Myth, co-authored by Sally Fallon Morrill, Cancer and the New Biology of Water and Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. Quote, once one begins to see the real structure and workings of a living organism, a new biology emerges that paradoxically is eerily reminiscent of the biology that grounds ancient healing practices. What do you know? Until his recent retirement from active practice, Dr. Cowan had a general medicine practice, first in upstate New York, and then for 17 years in Peterborough, uh, New Hampshire, and for 17 years in good old San Francisco, uh, glad to be out of there, I'm sure, Tom. Uh, yep. <laughs> the late great city. <laughs> it was a once great city. I used to live there. Uh, he I was, was a born there. Board. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh, baptized in uh, St. Peter and Paul's in North Beach and wow. lived the first year of my life in Little Italy because my uh, folks, you know, immigrated from Italy there. So wow. uh, then growing up in Marin County across the bridge, we just regularly went over there to hang with the you know, with the relatives and go to Little Italy and all the the old school delicatessens and bakeries, you know, and and yeah, uh, those yeah, are yeah. all gone now. But it was yeah. it was a great great place, great neighborhoods. Yeah, that was in the fifties, so right. North North Beach, cool. one of the only places that has sun in the city. Uh, <laughs> my my oldest son was born in the city. Um, yeah, I have a I have a special place in my heart for San Francisco, and it's a tragedy to see what's become of it. But hey, it's never too late to turn that place around. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, uh, also Tom was a founding board member of the Weston A. Price Foundation and currently serves as its vice president. Dr. Cowan continues to actively lecture and interview, sharing information via his website, drtomcowan.com, which is in the show notes here below. Where, he's also, where he also offers many of the products he, he has used personally and in his practice. Additionally, Dr. Ta, uh, Dr. Cowan offers high quality beyond organic vegetable powders and kitchen staples on his drcowansgarden.com website. Dr. Cowan lives with his wife, Linda, on rural farmland in upstate New York. Uh, he has three children, one stepson, and seven thriving grandchildren. Uh, my family's in upstate right now, actually technically in Pennsylvania, but on our family cottage there outside of Binghamton, uh, where I oh, spent yeah. most of my summers, Tom. Uh, anyways, Bear, take it away. Great. Tom, really looking forward to chatting with you. Always a pleasure, uh, you know, to have you here. So thanks for yeah. making time with us. Thank you, I, guys. I really can. Yeah. Well, I consider you, you know, one of the very important voices out there. You spent many years on the front lines actually learning how things function and then applying that to helping people. And I respect that very much. And what we'd really like to talk about today is uh, your new biology initiative. It's so important that people like yourself pass on your knowledge to the next generation because I think it's sorely needed. So if you could fill us in on what's going on there, and then maybe we can use that along the way as a little bit of a uh, launching place to go into some tangents about old biology and some of the things that doctor types might benefit in unlearning uh, at this point. So, so welcome, Tom. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Great to be here with you. You're real pioneers and, and, uh, bright lights in this whole 
experience or whatever it is that we're all doing. I don't know, sometimes. Um, so, you know, all I can really say is when I look back on my life, I didn't know that there was a sort of defined, you might say, spiritual path that it looks like I've been on unwittingly or unknowingly. And that is, I think they call it in Hindu or something, the no-no path. And that path is essentially don't worry about what's true. Just find out what isn't true. And then somehow that process will lead you to the promised land. And again, I didn't know I was doing that, but I started, you know, I mean, is it? teenager before like i don't really believe this like this doesn't make sense and i committed to uh when there was a choice and there's often a choice here that we all make between like what everybody thinks versus what you can see with your own eyes or reason with your own mind i think it is or experience with your own heart i think you got to go with the with the latter, not the former. The argument that well, everybody thinks you're wrong or everybody believes differently just doesn't work. So that led me, you know, the heart doesn't pump the blood. There's a whole different what reason the blood moves in the body. The uh, you know uh, viruses don't exist, and ge- cancer has nothing to do with genetics. And, you know, sort of one thing after another. But what I've discovered in the last few years is that process has taken like an, a kind of an exponential <laughs> growth. And it was partly through actually conversations with Stefan Lanka and then reading the work of Harold Hillman and then reacquainting myself with Gilbert Ling, who is another biologist. and. Then I started to realize that this sort of debunking or it's not this process goes to just about everything in modern biology. There is no sodium potassium pump in the cell membrane. There are no receptors in the cell membrane. There's no such thing as an immune system. There's no synapses in nerves. Uh, There's no... Uh, neurotransmitters don't don't promote nerve transmission. Uh, genetics is mostly a, a bunch of hooey. The DNA is not the stable uh, element that determines the life or the structure of a living organism. And it just kept going. And I was not necessarily prepared or looking for this. It just was, well, then the next thing. And, you know, even something like yesterday, I actually did a webinar on malaria. I don't know if you guys have looked into malaria, but malaria is considered one of the crowning achievements and most settled scientific, uh, you know, accomplishments of of the last hundred years. Everybody knows it's this unicellular parasite called a plasmodium. And it's a transmitted by mosquitoes and mosquitoes bite you and then they bite the next person. And there's five stages in the life cycle. And that's why they do mosquito netting. And now they're going to roll out this vaccine and the whole bit. And, you know, as I presented yesterday, and I don't know that I want to go into the whole thing here, none of that's actually true. And in fact, when you go back to the 1880s and 1870s when this was first being proposed the the people at the time the doctors the microbiologists the toxicologists the malaria people said these aren't uh parasites infecting your red blood cells this is just what a red blood cell looks like when it's deteriorating there's no they've never seen these five stages this one becomes this one becomes this one. They've never pulled out a parasite, isolated a parasite, and shown that it caused disease in any human or animal. And even you have these crazy things like, 
you know, Haiti and the Dominican Republic are on the same place, right? Same island. Haiti has a huge amount of malaria. The Dominican Republic has essentially no malaria. So what is it? The mosquitoes can't fly from one place to another? I mean, you keep going into these things and you realize that none of the explanations essentially in conventional medicine, conventional biology, are actually founded in truth and logic and something called science. Now, that led to a kind of hypothesis. And I, I would admit this is a, a, a theory that I have. And I'd be interested to see if you guys agree with this. I came to the conclusion that you cannot um, create a healthy system, be it medical care, be it your body, be it a culture or a society or a relationship between two people that's not grounded in truth. Now, a lot of people try, you know, they have relationships that aren't grounded in truth or they they say it doesn't matter whether there's a virus or not, we're going to treat you anyways. And I frankly just don't see it like that. I think if your foundation is inaccurate, right? If you think that malaria is this mosquito past pathogen and that's it and you ignore that poor people who are starving and poison get malaria and healthy people who aren't starving and well fed and aren't being poisoned up the wazoo they don't get malaria right so it has nothing to do with who gets bit by a mosquito or not you you will never end up being able to treat somebody with malaria because you're you're wrong from the get go. You can't treat a nerve disease if you think that there are synapses, which, by the way, you can only see when you dehydrate the nerve for doing an electron microscopy, and the ends pull apart, making a gap which folds up, and they call that a synapse, a gap, and it's it's an artifact of the electron microscopy procedure. And the idea that there's this gap makes no sense when you realize how fast transmission is in the body. It can't be swimming across synapses, chemicals. It just makes no sense at all. So you come to a point where your sense of life and your reason and your logic, they don't, they're not compatible with conventional modern medical care. And then what you find out or what I found out is, interestingly, it seems like there was a great reset in the 1850 to 1900 time frame, where before that, people didn't think there were germs, uh, you know, causing disease. They didn't think there was, you know, DNA and genes and, and all this stuff that we think. They thought that we are basically an electromagnetic, you know, entity that was living in the ether, which is an electromagnetic field. And we were tapping into that. And healing came about by like putting somebody in a cathedral that concentrated this electromagnetic field and actually stimulated a therapeutic response in the person. That's or if you broke your bone, you would use sound or light and the bone would heal. And somehow in that time frame, we changed everything. We became a particle, right? We became a physical particle or millions and trillions of particles, which, which obey random laws, right? And so there's nothing to a broken bone. You broke your bone, you stick that two ends together, boom, that's it. The thing is, it doesn't work very well because that's not how it works. So that's a long-winded answer. Uh, being, I was essentially pushed <laughs> by my son and uh, like, dad, you got to tell people about this. You got to... Uh, you know, 
tell people what's not true and therefore what may be true and then actually start treating them but with with these kind of guidelines and that became the new biology clinic and the new biology curriculum essentially you know exposing people first to what's not true and then you wipe that slate clean because if you don't wipe that slate clean you go you go into this with all these misconceptions preconce you're you're like sherlock holmes said don't ever remember anything that's not true it just clogs your system up so you get rid of all that you realize what a, a beautiful experience we're all part of but we just don't see it so that's a long-winded answer to hopefully now that's uh amazingly well said i think you encapsulated everything that uh, we talk about a lot I'll bet. and it all goes back to we live in a functional realm and i explain what i did years in clinic as bio terrain medicine but it's really functional medicine when you understand how our realm works as you're explaining on the larger macro scale those old sayings as above so below know yourself yeah. you'll know the universe you realize that all those same mechanisms work identically on all levels of life right down to our biology yes. and just as you did practicing functional medicine all those years you learned when you understand those mechanisms and apply them to medicine it has a much better outcome than yes. what we learned in conventional medicine and if if you wouldn't mind if i offer another possible plausible explanation for malaria it comes from the biochemic understanding and you take somebody that goes down to the southern hemisphere number one they're bringing in a lot more moisture into their lungs and therefore that accumulates into the bloodstream and now if they are uh, deficient in potassium chloride which is responsible for removing excess fluids when they where they don't belong then the pulse is going to need to speed up if you're uh, deficient in uh um, you know, different iron elements, then that's going to prevent a, or it's going to create a deficiency of oxygen. And so the pulse speeds up, uh, the body goes through a lot of chills and everything, literally trying to wring out the extra uh, yeah. fluids. And then after a fever, you start sweating, then you feel better until you accumulate fluids again, then you have another episode. The other thing is that when you take that same individual and they go back home to a more northern climb they're fine again so it's there's really these functional mechanisms that you realize part of it's created by deficiencies and there's also other levels but these are the things that you're explaining that aren't taught to us in conventional medicine let me correlation? let me just dissect that for a minute because sure. because uh so there, there's two sides of this. So there's my side pre, pre, predominantly, which is it's not this parasite, it's not this mosquito thing, right? So right. so we got through that. Now, the 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 principle behind of the oh. core principles, and one of the things that I learned to ask myself with every single patient that came in why does this experience you have right now that fever or chills or sweat or whatever why does this make sense to your body and in fact is the body's therapeutic response right those that symptoms those symptoms those are, are not the disease right and, and essentially the disease model evaporates there's no malaria there's no you know, there's no AIDS, there's no cancer, there's no cold, there's none of that stuff. There's, you're in a situation where something has happened, your body has to make it right, given the tools that it has, and given the situation. So, right, it, so then you're just applying the details. So you don't have potassium chloride, so you have to do something in order to compensate for that. And you don't have iron, so your red blood cells deteriorate, and then they falsely see say that there's this parasite when it's just the old malaria people say that's not a parasite, that's just your red blood cells breaking down. 
and they were right. And, and so you start seeing the whole world of disease better, uh, differently. And as you say, it works so much better because the other way, you know, you poison people. So now you have two problems. You used to have the deficiency problem. And now you got the poisoning from the chloroquine problem uh, in addition to that. And you've stopped your body from healing. That's the pro That's a huge problem. Your body was trying to wring some water out, you know, and you stopped it. So now you've got the problem with the medicine and you still got the water in there because you didn't let yourself wring it out. And that's how you get sicker and sicker and sicker. And that's exactly the story of Western medicine. Their point is to make you sicker and they're good at it. So when we go... Go ahead. I Mike. just say right now, I'm loving that we're talking about malaria because one of the big fear stories right now, you know, on the whole news cycle is the red states are being attacked by Gates, uh, new <laughs> GMO mosquito or whatever. Yeah. And that there's now malaria being found in Florida and Texas for the first time. So what would be an explanation there? Is this just a lot of um, sort of fear tactic, uh, hocus pocus by the media? Or uh, is there some sort of potential? Because we know that one vector for delivering some sort of bioweapon, even though Bear and I have held that for the most part, bioweapons have never, you know, in terms of, of course, a viral bioweapon is, is, is BS because there's no such thing as a virus. But that's not to say a tick couldn't deliver something right into the bloodstream. So is there a potentiality for a some sort of mechanism through a mosquito to uh, to deliver some sort of a new bioweapon? The, the first thing I would do, and, and one of the things that I realized was was so important with treating patients. And, you know, this is a common uh, saying in medicine that there's no incurable diseases. There's only incurable patients. So one of the things, you know, the, the people that, in a sense, scared me the most, scared me in the sense of I had the hardest time helping them. Like, so person comes in, so how are you doing? I have fibromyalgia. So how do you feel? Well, I, I have fibromyalgia and people with fibromyalgia feel tired and pain. So, so, do you, so do you feel pain? When do you feel pain? Well, people with fibromyalgia, they feel pain at night and then sometimes, and I couldn't get them to own the problem that this is not fibromyalgia. I'm done with those kind of categorizing or even malaria. Because if you look at the symptoms of malaria, it's, you know, weakness, fever, sweating, chills. What are the symptoms of the flu? You know, weakness, fever, sweating, chill. What are the symptoms of COVID? Weakness, fever, sweating, chills. What are the symptoms of you know, lung uh, moistures, fevers, <laughs> this nonsense. And they say there's 247 million cases of malaria. And I always ask, are you sure it's not 246 million? And the reason I say it like that is because, A, nobody measured, right? These are just wild guesses based on computer models. And second of all, there is no defined syndrome of AIDS, of COVID, of malaria. And so what you end up doing when you do realistic medicine is how, how do you feel? What are What is your experience? Like, tell me what it's like to be you and then how you got there. Now, could they induce people to get sick by injecting some, you know, some thing in in a some mosquito that's been transformed i'm not sure i like the gmo thing because i don't think you can actually genetically modify anything that's relevant and it, and i say that because when you look at the method section of how they gmo something it's basically just stick a sequence in a bacteria you know in a culture with the bacteria and get the bacteria to make a protein so it's the bacteria like the E. coli 
that's making the protein. You're not genetically modified, which also gets into what one of the things I've found, and I don't think I'm the only one, is every story we hear that turns out to be just a story, like the mosquito story, the effect is, A, it pr gives more power over us in our minds to the, quote, bad guys, right? Oh, they have a lot of power. They can really hurt it. And it also makes us think they really understand a lot more about biology than, than we know. Like they can go in there and with the tweezers, manipulate these mosquitoes and make them do things which no mosquito could ever really do otherwise. Aren't they amazing in their technological wizardry? Right? So, so that's the effect of all this lab leak, all this stuff has those two effects. The reality is they're just taking mosquitoes and mixing it with some bacteria, and it's not very sophisticated, complicated. And can they get biting insects to make us sick? I don't know. Maybe. We'll see, but it's not something I'm going to spend a lot of time worrying about. Yeah. At one time, I was under the impression that ticks were a, a vector of transmission for Lyme and so forth. But since then, I've I've discarded that for a number of reasons. But um, this discussion yeah. is great. Could we use it to segue into genetic theories and uh, things that you're coming to conclude at this point? Absolutely. Good. Let's go for it. So you want me to just launch in so the so yeah it's always so let's put these things in so what is convent what are we told you know what what are we taught uh we're we're taught that a that the blueprint of life is this chemical called dna which is found in the nucleus and it's in a diffuse extended state normally so that it can be transcribed, mean copied into mRNA in the nucleus. The mRNA goes out of the nucleus and goes to the ribosomes, which are in the cytoplasm, and it gets translated into proteins and the proteins are our living structure, right? Does that sound right to you guys? Yeah. And so inherent like, uh, in that high is high school biology to me. High school biology. Every cell has the same DNA. You get half from mother, half from father, and it's unchanged through your life. That's your DNA. That's your blueprint. And you pass that on to your children. And this thing called evolution works because you get a change in your DNA through a mistake or through radiation or through chemicals or just randomly. And some of them are worse and they cause disease. And some of them are better and they give you a selective advantage and those are selected and then you the, the, your pro progeny are better off. That's the normal theory. So let's take a look at this, some of the details of this. Uh, and by the way, the DNA is a double helix. That's the Watson and Crick thing. Uh, let's, let's dissect that a little bit. So the first thing is the DNA is an extended form in the nucleus. It's a long strand. And then it gets wound up into chromosomes, which you see only when the cell is divided. Now, I happened to be in uh, college biology. There was a teacher there, a guy named Nichols, who I believe was eventually nominated for a Nobel Prize for discovering how DNA folds up into these chromosomes, right? So, and he was a brilliant teacher and et cetera. So you got this long strand folds up into the chromosomes. And I happened to get into his, his upper level biology class so he's getting, he gives a demonstration of how this works. So he has a string and he winds it around the classroom about 10 times and on like stanchions. And then he has a thimble and he says, okay, I'm going to fold this string and fold it into the 
thimble, and that would recreate how the DNA folds into forming these chromosomes. And he said that if this was a realistic model, there would be like a hundred times the string and the thimble would be about this size. So he starts doing it, he's stick, sticking the string and he's folding it back and forth. And he gets about one and a half times around the classroom and then no more string will fit in the thimble. And he starts with a stick, you know, sticking it in there. And then he, and then he says if, after about two times, you can't get any more string in the thimble. Isn't it amazing that the that the living system, the body, can put this hundred times the string into the thimble? And everybody in the class stood up and cheered like, "Oh, the human body is amazing! It can do this." And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, "Wait a minute! He just showed me that that doesn't fit into the thimble, <laughs> and I don't think it fits in the thimble." <laughs> And you don't have any idea how that string can fit in the thimble. And so I don't really think that chromosome is wound up DNA. So that was the first thing. The second thing is they have this theory that one gene, right, makes one protein. So that's how it works. <clears throat> so they do the Human Genome Project, 200,000 or so proteins, right, 20,000 genes. So there's 180,000 gene uh, proteins that are unaccounted for by genes. So where's the code for them? Well, there isn't one. What do you mean there isn't one? That's the whole point is the genes code for the proteins. You got 80%, 90% of them, there's not even a code there. Well, maybe they rearrange or something. I don't know how they come about. So that's a huge problem. We have 90% of the proteins, they don't even have a code. The third thing, so the, D, the DNA is made into mRNA in the nucleus, right? Then it goes out of the membrane of nucleus has a pore. You can see that on a living cell. It's got a membrane. And you can measure the pH in the nucleus and in the cytoplasm, and it's different which means the hydrogen ions can't equilibrate across the nuclear membrane, right? Otherwise, the pH would be the same. So how do you have a system where the mRNA made in the nucleus, which is thousands of times bigger than a hydrogen ion, can get out of the nucleus without letting the hydrogen ions get in and out themselves? It's the problem of how do you make a mosquito netting that keeps the mosquitoes, that lets elephants out, but keeps the mosquitoes <laughs> from getting in? And the answer is there isn't a mosquito netting like that. Uh, so there's no way for that system to work. Now, they realized that, and so then they made up the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a tube that opens into the nucleus. So the mRNA finds its way through the tube and crawls out down the endoplasmic reticulum. And then there's a whirly gig in the endoplasmic reticulum, which binds to the mRNA, whirls around and deposits it in the cytoplasm all the time, not letting the hydrogen ions get in the whirly gig. Now, when you go looking for a picture of the whirly gig, you know, there is no picture of the whirly gig. So you say, how do you know there's a whirly gig there? Well, if there was no whirly gig, how would it get in and out? Right. <laughs> so, so that's crazy because, you know, it's like the sodium potassium pump. They measure sodium is different on the inside and the outside, potassium different inside and outside. There's a pump in the membrane with the whirly gig that binds and, you know, there's two Nobel Prizes for the sodium potassium membrane bound pump. So Gilbert Link comes along, strips the membrane off, and the, the um, sodium potassium concentration is the same, meaning there's no pump in the membrane that has anything to do with it, because if you take the membrane off, the concentration is the same. So they just made up a whirly gig to explain what they couldn't explain. So that's, that's another problem. 
that the the fourth problem is it is absolutely definitively shown now that the DNA is different in every cell of your body or every tissue. There is no doubt, and it changes all the time. It's just a one of the many chemicals which I would say are just condensed frequencies, right? They're not even chemicals, really. They're just dense frequencies. And of course, they're changing and fluctuating. So there is no stable DNA, which is you. Uh, there's maybe characteristics like there is eye color, but there is no fixed chemical. That is a disproven hypothesis. Uh, so, you know, I could go on, but there's so many... Even, you know, when I read Watson and Crick, how do you know that the the DNA is a double helix, right? It's one of the foundational scientific discoveries of our time. I, I was just seeing if I had the paper. Nature, 1953, it says right in there. So a double helix is defined by the rotation, right? So every 10 base pairs, it rotates. And it says in there, we discovered the DNA is a double helix when we assumed that the, that the base pairs rotated every 10 base pairs. And I remember reading that and thinking, what do you mean you assumed? That's like the whole thing. You're supposed to measure <laughs> that, right? That's like six inches. I did a tape measure. It's six inches. No, they assumed it rotated like that. So that it rotated. I mean, so Tom, are they not? Uh, so I think a lot of people that are hearing this for the first time will say, "Well, can't they observe this with with microscopes, slice no. the cell, and see all this good stuff?" I mean, I remember in I was an honors biology student or AP. I memorized this stuff, and they had all the models there. And I, I, you always thought, "Well, obviously, this is just from direct observation." Right. So DNA, it came from the famous Rosalind Franklin photo 51, which was an X. They, they took, it, when you go to the quote methods section, how did they find this DNA? They took white blood cells, they extracted the nuclei, they mixed it with, with phosphoric acid instead of sulfuric acid. And then they came out with a phosphorus rich chemical, which they said wasn't a protein, because proteins are sulfuric acid. So this was a phosphorus-based chemical. It's something different. They called it nucleine, and that became DNA. They never seemed to think that the reason they got a phosphorus-rich chemical was because they changed the acid that they extracted it with to phosphoric acid instead of sulfuric acid. Anyways, sounds a little seems, bit like virology. <laughs> it's, it's all virology over and over. And then, so then they dry it and powder it. And then, believe it or not, and I can, I have the whole thing right here. They expose this powdered chemical to x rays for 61 straight hours, right? X ray B, this is the fragile chemical of life. Sulf, uh, phosphoric acid, dehydration, centrifuging, x-ray for 61 hours, and they get an image on an x-ray film that looks like an X. And that became the, the visual evidence that it was a double helix. Now, the interesting thing about that is about 20 years ago, a bunch of grad students did a similar experiment but instead they started with the spring of a ballpoint pen and they got the identical image, hmm. which means that a reasonable conclusion is the blueprint of life is just as likely to be springs from a ballpoint pen as it is to be DNA. Uh, and maybe it is, I don't know, but uh, I don't think so. So now, so and when you say ribosomes, so you saw them in biology. That's where the mRNA is translated, made into proteins. There's thousands of these ribosomes. They're the factories of life. They convert mRNA into protein. They're hugely important with the mRNA shots because they go to the ribosomes. Now, here's the problem. 
And this again, I get from Harold Hillman. Um, when you go back, how do they find the ribosomes? What do they look like? They're all perfect circles on a two-dimensional uh, electron microscopy image. Every single one of them. You can't see it in a light microscope. They're too small. So in order for something to be a perfect circle on a dehydrated electron beam, chemically extracted, it would have been a sphere in real life, right? In, you know, if you take an orange and you slice it longitudinally, and then you'd get a circle. So in other words, these ribosomes must be circles in real life. Now, what are the chances if you took an orange, like a circle, a sphere, and put it in a blender, that every piece would be a perfect circle? You know what the answer is? It's none. <laughs> and that's what they did to the tissue to get this picture of a ribosome. In other words, it's an artifact. And Hillman proved it by doing taking something that couldn't possibly have a ribosome in it. And he did the whole electron microscopy technique and he got the perfect circles because it's a gas bubble. And so somehow I, I, I they say, showed I, you I, pictures of gas bubbles for the last 70 years and there are no ribosomes there's there, it makes no physical geometric sense or logic there cannot be such a I will say looking at dead stained slides or uh, the electron microscopy has been one of the biggest downfalls of 20th century science uh and I wish we could get back to like Gaston Nason's style microscope or yeah. Royal Rife had to get the magnification so we could really start seeing the living, you know, terrain at a very microscopic level. That is something that I'm going to be focused on. And we're going to be starting a terrain fund through the end of COVID. I had this dialogue with Adam Biggleson yesterday. And let's start going there again. I mean, Royal Rife had this technology in the 20s. It's like, why can't, I mean, look what we're supposedly have all this amazing tech. It's 2023, right? All, uh, we're supposedly uh, sending rockets back up into space and have these, these new fancy satellites going everywhere. And Bear right now is beaming to us off grid. And we've got an entire, all of NASA and one little phone from when we went to the moon. And yet we can't get a microscope like Royal Rife had in the 1920s. Right. Yeah, I, I have a bit of a backstory on that where I was involved with some things I can't mention live here, but um, we were actually trying to find uh, fund the next level of uh, microscopy because yeah. I actually did workshops with Gaston Naissance myself and, you know, got to look in those things. And um, what happened is we were uh, intervened by interpol and fbi with uh, the folks we were trying to create these technologies overseas with so the short answer is uh certain interests don't want this information out and you know mike i told you uh, you know with the biggelsons here we're saying hey just we've got all of these um projects out there raising money that's not going anywhere how about buying us a freaking microscope so we can yeah. do what we already know how to do but you know tom what what's became apparent to me early on and everything you're saying is that we're constantly trying to go from this theoretical magic bb theory you know where you have all these particles and trying to re uh, uh, reverse engineer from the ground up rather than understanding how things actually precipitate from top down. So based on everything you just explained to us, which is fantastic for our audience, can you maybe present a more plausible theory on how cellular biology works? Yeah. <clears throat> so if you just stick with reality, meaning what you can actually see, and what you can prove exists. What you see is we have tissues, uh, it's approximately 188 of them. 44 of them we know don't have any cells in them. They're syncytium, so they're basically organized uh, acellular structures. 
The others may have cells, although I sort of doubt it. But let's just say they're organized tissue or maybe even compartments called cells. And then you see this dome-shaped circular nucleus with a membrane. And then you have organized or coherent or gel-like water, which has protein infrastructure like the scaffolding. And it also has lipids and minerals and other things dissolved in it. And then you have a, a very thin membrane around the cell, like jello has a kind of skin on it, but there's no real membrane. And then you have these inclusion bodies, which are called mitochondria. And they're like the power source, the power pack. They make ATP. That's at least the chemical carrier, but it's not to do with energy. ATP uh, essentially binds to the proteins and unfolds them. And then the water collects on those unfolded proteins and forms a gel. It, the ATP plays the role that heat plays in making jello, right? You put jello, proteins, water, nothing happens. You heat it, unfolds the proteins, the water attaches, then you cool it, it makes a gel. So that's what you have. You have, again, so you have this dome with an antenna in it. And then the DNA might be the antenna. And then it's embedded in a watery pool of crystalline coherent structured water. And then it's got a power source, you know, scattered around in there. And that's it. Now, usually I ask people, and I can show you a picture of the Taj Mahal, right? And you see this dome with an antenna and then, you know, capacitors into a pool of water. So it's the exact same structure, which tells you that that was not some tomb for some guy's wife or something. That was a power source. That was a creation of healing energy. It was harvesting the ether, the electromagnetic field, and bringing that information down into the water to create health and harmony and power for the people to use in their productive lives. And that's the same thing that happens in us. You have this antenna that downloads information from the light and the sound and the ether and your feelings and your thoughts and your intention. And just to say consciousness in total, you harvest that energy, you, you, you the dome acts like a capacitor or it, it, it concentrates that energy field and it gets downloaded into water and the intelligence of the water itself no other code needed allows the structures to be made that are needed by the organism a, a lot according to its intention and and that Mitochondria just make the sort of power to sort of run the system. And that's it. And every illness and every natural therapy, you can see based on that, some problem with that model. Like your, your water is distorted because you got poison grapes dissolved in your jello. So what do you do? You heat the water up. That's the fever. You make it run out. That's called snot. You cough it out, and then you reconstitute a more perfect gel. That's illness. You you have a you have a faulty electromagnetic field because you think you should just have computers all day instead of the sunlight. You never got in the sun, and the, you never put your feet on the earth, or you're thinking toxic thoughts of "I'm going to get people all the time" and all that. That's what I do. Um, uh, then. <laughs> You know, then you download hateful information into your water and you make or here's a better example. You download lies into your water and then your nervous system is a tangled mess. And what do we call a tangled mess of nerves? That's Alzheimer's disease. They say neurofibrillary tangles. 
<laughs> which means it's all tangled up because yesterday you thought one thing and then you lied about that and then you lied about this and it's all this tangled nonsense so you can see the the world gets downloaded the consciousness gets downloaded into your physical structure and that's why there's saunas and you know like um cell salts you're missing potassium chloride in the in the water so the crystal isn't quite right so you get a distorted protein and then you have to get rid of that and that's called a certain illness you know unfortunately and sweat lodges hyperthermia uh you know sound healing light healing it's all either the information or the receiver is off and all you have to do is treat that and you'll be fine that's what they and used to that's the, the old biology yeah. and and one of the biggest missing elements is that it's a two-way cycle so as we're focused our consciousness on a one-way deterministic uh externalization of what makes us all we have to do is put our consciousness back to source which will precipitate all that yuck uh yeah. back up to where it came from so that it can be purified and have a chance to precipitate a more perfect medium you know the next go around but we're all focused here on the ground and what's wrong and all these things that we yeah. can blame all our ills on and that's what you call a complete toroidal field yes yeah role <clears throat> so well what role does light play into this tom and I'm, that's what i'm been interested in lately because we've covered water structured water primary water uh obviously masoro emoto's work veda yeah. austin's work right. understanding like what emoto showed when you have that that you're telling the lie to the water or having that discord it literally fractures the crystallization and we've seen that with um veda austin's work and it makes so much sense that that's directly happening in our in our water structured water systems but then Curious. Yeah, and that's the code, not DNA. Yes. That's the code. And it's fractal, right? It's a fractal yep. code. Uh, and I mean, uh, so I'm just curious what your sort of theory of light is, <laughs> what light is and how well, light is is at least one of, if not the primary information source. And there's various kinds of light. Moonlight is different than sunlight and different from the light from stars, you know, that that's a whole can of Quali worms there. Yes, the qualitative, that's what I was getting at, because obviously they call it photons, back to particles. It's just a singular structure of, of, right. of a particle of light, and it totally denies the qualitative nature right. of the different types of light and the different sort of spectrum of light and this relates to color as well yes uh, and this to me is what's so exciting about the new biology um even uh, more on the mainstream they're starting to recognize this the the qualitative aspects of color and how it relates to the mitochondria and the structured water a bear has some very fa fascinating uh, concepts around the rays of color and stuff too that go right. a little more esoteric but um, I think this is going to be really exciting to see where this all goes in the relationship of light and water. And, and you well, know, not just or you, you bring up a good point, Mike, because you see, we have a science of quantity. But I would contend that people in their real lives don't make choices based on quantity. In other words, how many of you or of us chose our wife because she had a hundred more sulfurs than the next woman? <laughs> Not me. Uh, there was a quality there that is that you cannot put into a, a measurement, right? That is the reason we do everything. It's the reason I buy this knife instead of that knife because the quality of the knife feels better, it looks better, it makes my life feel differently and easier. I don't analyze the iron in it versus the next one, because even though that may be interesting to a certain extent, it's not how we de make decisions in life. We are qualitative sensors. And that, I think, is also the magic of biogeometry. 
he was talking about the science of quality, not quantity. And where we went wrong is we have the science of quantity, not quality. We pretend that quality of things doesn't exist. You know, and the reason you love this woman is she gives off 20 more pheromones than this one has 19 and this one is 21. And otherwise it's anecdotal. Right. (laughs) My love feeling (laughs) the feeling of what I experience around this person as opposed to this. That's not science, even though that is your direct experience. And I would contend that all of us live our lives based on that process. And a lot of uh, the work with light and color is not esoteric because uh, for years, uh, you know, I've worked a lot with uh, medicine uh, by way of the ear where you're accessing those brain centers with color uh, filters and feeling the, the changes in the pulse. Uh, this has been borne out in a UCLA 10 years of open brain surgeries that it actually creates changes. Uh, we can go in and access memories that have to do with chronic illnesses or accidents and literally erase those memories with the right kind of color that you can test yeah. beforehand and find which one works. So, and And of course, color is just living consciousness. And if we're talking about the real code, in anything it's in that akashic record which walter russell described as the inert gases that are the gateways to every octave for every element on the true spiral uh, periodic table of elements so you know now we're getting into from top down science which can be demonstrated like the old alchemist in the 1600s now instead of talking about fire air water earth we can talk about the different elements associated with each one describe how nitrogen coagulates the first two volatile uh, ethers and then translates into water, which is the transmitting community, uh, you know, utility for everything that meets the ground. So a lot of this stuff isn't esoteric anymore. It just seems that way because we've never been taught the truth. Yeah. Well, I'm glad there's people like you, Bear, who can take, you know, I'm, I'm like a generalist, right? So I get that the overview. And when you start getting into, you know, what the nitrogen is doing, I'm like, I'll leave that to Bear and some other people who get into the more details. Because for me, once you get the point here that this isn't what we were told, and that there's a whole nother, much more magical and beautiful and scientific way to see it, right? It's based on logic and experience and true experiments. It's just amazing what's really, what the kind of world that we live in. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a gift to just be part of this. Life becomes fun again. Yeah, it's fun. And it's (laughs) in the other way where there's GMO mosquitoes about to get, I mean, that's, (laughs) that sucks, you know. Can you imagine living in that mindset in that world? I it really just pains me to see these people spinning out in in the cult of scientism and really going for all this and then having the sort of anger and the ego to attack anyone like us who's just asking questions, right? Yeah. And just pointing out what's wrong and what's not. Um, that's why I'm quite content. Um just being up here at the river, uh, barefoot and gardening and saying what I want. And I just don't care anymore what the quote unquote normies say. I just don't care. Yeah. <laughs> just, I, I'm pretty much there myself. I spend, you know, most of my days uh, I'm gardening and food processing. I do a lot of sauerkraut and, you know, all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. We make Today, my wife made, um, we picked milkweed flowers and made milkweed ale, which is really good, by the way. It's this amazing pink colored ale, you know, and I mean, when you think about doing that compared to, you know, working in computer stuff and, and office buildings and, and, and Wall Street trading, I mean, I 
<laughs> I can't even imagine it. I mean, you know, I'm, it's so I, satisfying I, when you make things like that too. And then, you know, you enjoy them after it's just yeah. uh, such a different experience than buying something from the store. So you're actually making ale and everything. Yeah. My wife is the ale maker and, you know, we, we have this huge garden. And so sometimes it's yarrow and sometimes it's milkweed and sometimes it's chamomile and sometimes it's a mix and sometimes it's mint. And I mean, we have every, plant we can think of growing in our garden that grows here well old school herbology uh you know at one time they felt that the best way of getting your herbal medicine was through wines and ales yeah, yeah. well i was yeah. just going to say back to the qualitative side and the communication of water is that when you grow your own food that food is now synced with you right yeah and there is a an experience there i know my, i see it with my kids when they planted the berry bushes and, or, well, we buy those, but, you know, planted herbs and veggies and then get to eat those, uh, there is an enjoyment there, of course, of the creative aspect of it. But I think even more, there's a resonance going on with an understanding of the information that's like, hey, I was born and we have, we put the seeds in our mouths before yeah. we, we do all that and big fans of Anastasia, which is, that's a painting of her behind me that was gifted to me. Wow. Um, uh, who's the Russian mystic who talks about a lot of this stuff. Right. Um, but that being said, there is a, an inherent emotional uh, experience that you have when you're eating the stuff you've grown yourself. And it's undeniable. Undeniable. I mean, it's of course comes out in the smells and the freshness and, but it's, it's just, it's just reconnects with the experience of what it means to be a, uh, you know, a man or woman living in this on this earth, you know, you you care for your sustenance, you take responsibility, and you interact with other living beings. And I, I tell you, one of the biggest lessons of these last two years was is, you know, I finally had the opportunity. We have like twelve animals now: four goats and four cats and four chickens, and to see what that interaction is, it changes your life. And I'm to the point where I don't see how you can be a doctor unless you've actually cared for uh, like a, a, a kind of free living animal, because I've seen them heal things that I would have thought were impossible. But they do it, you know, like effortlessly and they move effortlessly and they you know, these we have this baby goat and he plays like just with the unbelievable joy. Yeah. You just, you know, you you see that and you think, what am I so pissy about? Like, <laughs> he, you know, June bug, that's his name. He just wants to to have fun and jump and dance and like, what's my problem? Anyways, I could go on about that, but. No, Have you seen, there's a, a great clip on Instagram about a gal who says she's a farmer and uh, you could tell maybe came from suburbs, recent farmer. And she's like, oh, we got our six chickens and loved them so much. And it became we became so addicted to them. Well, what do you know? I decided let's get a goat. So then we got a goat. And then, you know, the goat needed a buddy. So we got two more goats. And then we're like, you know what? It'd be kind of fun to have some sheep. Yeah. And then so then we went out and we got a couple sheep. And then we thought, well, got these sheep. Well, you know, let's get a cow. And before we know it, we have a full farm. Yeah. And, you know, it's very true, man. Like it's, it, 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 that's a great way to start guys. If you're just getting your toes wet, start with some chickens, <laughs> see where you go from there. And we, uh, yeah. we got a new batch of chicks this year and we always start them out in our bathtub up, uh, you know, up in our master bedroom. And of course, when they get a certain age, they start flying up over the tub into our bed. We say, okay, time to go outside. But in the meantime, you get this really bond with them. So now they're full grown chickens and they're outside and they come to you. They're like little puppies, you know? And so, yeah, yeah animals are just such a special experience. And, yeah. you know, folks that don't believe that animals have a place in our life, uh, you know, as far as, you know, it gets into the whole debate about vegetarianism and, and using animal byproducts, but, uh, you know, you, you realize in that situation, it really is a humane give and take. And, and uh, you know, there's a lot of love that goes back and forth. And animals just are an indispensable part of our life. 
Yeah. So uh, good to good to hear you're back there uh, doing it upstate. I tell you, you know, it, and I, I have now I wouldn't have thought about this a few years ago, but amongst the other healing sounds and vibrations and, you know, electromagnetic fields, I can tell you uh, the purring of a cat belongs in that in that oh, yeah. conversation because I have this cat pumpkin and that guy can purr and you can hear him across the room and he it's just such an experience to have him you know sitting on your chest or on a part that's not feeling well and it's like a kind of sound therapy and I think it recreates these vibrations that were part of the old healing uh repertoire and I think really what you guys and us are doing is you know this was all reset and lost in the 1800s they got rid of it and so we don't really have to reinvent the wheel we have to rediscover what humans knew about all along and that's really our task and it's so gratifying to me to see so many people are doing this now you know what about sound healing what about light you know asking these questions how do you use light to heal how do you heal a broken bone with tuning forks and vibration and cell salts and herbs and ales you know like we don't know because we we forgot but it's out there and isn't it amazing how animals just gravitate to you when you're feeling a little bit under the weather and go right to the spot that's bothering yeah. you so uh Tom, if you wouldn't mind with some of the time we have left, can you, I know you're, you've trained some uh, folks to carry on your work and, you know, this brings us back to the, uh, the biological initiative. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about uh, what you're up to there? So, you know, yeah, I, you know, I've been mentoring young doctors and practitioners for a few years and, you know, I, I decided I'm not really in the space anymore to to do medicine like one-on-one -on -one. i'm just <laughs> you have to like you can't just garden all day and then it's like somebody says and and i i just couldn't do it and i don't want to do it anyways so we started this initiative where a doctor that i worked with uh you know you you can join the clinic and he's he, you know we've gone through how do you take a history how do you get somebody's story? How do you interface with this? And, you know, we're going to bring on another practitioner. And then we have uh, your friend, Pat, who does movement. And even just to say a little bit, a bit about that, you know, medicine these days is diagnosis, then treatment. So you have rheumatoid arthritis. What's the treatment for? Rather than asking the question, how do I make this person's life better, right? Like if you moved more, if you were stronger and more flexible, your life would be better whether you have rheumatoid arthritis supposedly or not. So in a sense, you're better focusing on what can I do to make my life better? I'll get stronger, more flexible, more stamina, get the right weight, you know, eat better, take herbs, salsa, all this thing. Suddenly, everything is better. And then amazingly, suddenly, you don't even have rheumatoid arthritis. Anymore. And nobody ever treated rheumatoid arthritis. They said, look, you can hardly, you're so weak, you can hardly lift this, this glass. Why don't you do this kind of you know, movement, you know, and like this? Next thing you know, you'll be able to lift it 100 times. Okay, I'll do it. And next thing you know, you do that with, with all kinds of things. And you don't even have that. You never had that disease. You were just weak and, you know, like falling apart, essentially. So that's what we're doing in the clinic. And then in the curriculum, we get uh, we're taking subjects like virology and how do you do a history and what does the heart not do? What does the heart really do? Getting practitioners, healthcare people together, like a cohort of 20, uh, having questions, reading stuff, seeing lectures. And at the end of it, hopefully there's 
hundreds of people who are doing quote medicine based on this model, not the old model that's run its course and it needs to be dead and buried. Absolutely. You know, some of the, I think the most valuable training I went through was some of the old osteopaths like John yeah. uh, Burrell from France is in the training you're deliberately taught to not ask the question what's wrong to your patient. That's yeah. up to you to figure out. And, right. and the whole premise was the less, you know, predispositions uh, you have in your mind by what they tell you, you actually have a better chance of finding out what's bugging them in the first place. So yeah. a whole different yeah. reversal of what we're taught in conventional medical training. Right. And you get people away from this maniacal focus on, I have fibromyalgia. Uh, that's the first thing that I did in my, you don't have anything. You have a story. Um, just t tell your story Let's find out what the story has to, you know, explain or offer to us. Get away from the labels and you free your, your healing abilities from just that process. It's the most important mm -hmm. thing I did in medicine is to get people away from that maniacal focus on, I am a victim of rheumatoid arthritis. Period. And of, yeah. And it's you genetic. Know, one thing I can't do anything about it. It's <laughs> incurable. You know, my doctor, he's the head of rheumatology at Harvard. He said it's a genetic thing. Nobody in my family has it, you know. <laughs> Must be genetic. Can't tell me what gene it is either, because there isn't one. Uh can't even tell me the mechanism. But, anyways, must be true. So could we just have a couple of comments? I think we touched it last time we talked uh, with you about the heart. And, uh, you know, I'm a fan of Frank Chester and his work yeah. uh, and the fact that the, the heart is actually working much differently. And then maybe with that, talk about some things like Strophanthus, which uh, was an old uh, German remedy that I used when I first got into the isopathic work, you know, with the pleosanum. Uh, that was one of their big remedies. Yeah. And I think it works on different levels other than just strengthening the cardiac muscle and so forth. So um, I think it's a fascinating subject. And since uh, the seed atom, as we call it, which unfolds our whole embryological uh, development uh, is based in the heart. And, uh, I, you know, just my feeling is it carries the whole Akashic records of our being in between embodiments. There's a lot going on in that heart. So what we think of as heart ailments and arrhythmias and things, there's uh, really, I think, wouldn't be a problem if we understand what was really going on there. Right. I mean, again, you know, my process is always starting with what they think. What nor They think the heart is a mechanical pump that squeezes. And because of the squeezing of the muscle, there's a pressure propulsion of the blood that moves it around the body. And that's ludicrous. First of all, in, you know, if you're talking about thousands of miles of tiny little of, of tubes with a very viscous fluid in it, where stuff in it that's about the same diameter as the tube, in order to generate that much pressure to gener to push it all the way around, would be literally thousands of times higher than the heart actually generates. So on the face of it, it can't be. And then to make it more absurd, uh, when you look at a cardiac catheterization, you see the blood come out of the heart, right? The left ventricle, the aortic valve, the heart, the blood comes out and then it goes up, goes through a valve, uh, sorry, the aortic arch, and then comes down. So if you think about it, if you're going to push that hard to get all this blood around the body and you have a flexible arch, the arch would have to straighten out. Just like if you have a garden hose and you put it in an arch and you turn it off, it's an arch. You turn it on full blast, the hose straightens out, right? But what you find is that when you put, when systole, the pumping so-called, the arch bends in. 
And I remember when I was in college, I worked in a cardiac cath lab and I saw the, uh, the arch bending in during systole. And I said to the cardiologist, that doesn't make any sense because if you're pushing, it should straighten, not bend in. He said, well, that's just the way it does. Right. Uh, so that should tell you that it cannot, it's, it's a suction, not a push. Okay. So how does it work? Well, the other thing is the blood essentially stops at the tissue level because it has to offload food and oxygen and pick up carbon dioxide and waste. And so you wouldn't need a pump when the blood is already moving the fastest at the entrance of the heart and the exit. You would need a pump where the blood is stopped at the tissues. So the pump has to be at the tissues and not at the heart. So what happens is because of, you know, Gerald Pollack did experiments with this. If you put a horizontal tube that's hydrophilic and you fill it with water, it creates a separation of charges and the positive charges go into the middle. They repel each other and start moving. And that process is actually enhanced by light, by UV light. So you shine a light on a living system. It structures the water in the capillaries. That creates a separation of charges and movement. And that goes faster and faster just because it's, it's you know, going from a wetland to a, ri a river. Goes up to the heart, going fast. The heart is like a dam fills up the chamber of the heart. And when the pressure in the incoming side is more than the pressure on the other side, there's a vacuum on the other side of the dam gate. The gate opens and it suctions in and the blood essentially is distributed through this vortex action in the heart to the rest of the body. And in the heart, it's not squeezing, it's vortexing so like the sufis say where you know the heart is stopped and there's a vortex that's where the energy of the world or god comes into the heart through that vortex uh created in the heart and that's how it works and then there's little vortices in there that distribute certain blood to different organs which is fascinating and that's how it works and you know, strophanthus has to do with improving the metabolism of the heart. So it gets, it oxygenates better, gets rid of waste products, gets rid of lactic acid. So it is the heart disease remedy for set, you know, a long time. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and it basically gets into a lot of Schauberger implosion yeah. mechanics. Right. And also when you get into more esoteric practices, uh, embryonic breathing, where you're connecting with source and with every breath, bringing it into the heart and feeling yeah. the heart just expand the light. So, uh, but I think that could do just as much good for anyone with a heart problem than anything. Yeah. And it's heart. This vortex creates this toroidal field, which is your biosphere essentially. And that's mm -hmm. what interacts with the world and with other people and all the plants and animals. And what we have is people with contracted biospheres. And that was part of that. It's interesting that the biosphere typically is about six feet out. And so part of the whole COVID ploy was to keep people out of each other's biosphere, which then weakens it. And they contract more and more until that energy is just trapped in your heart, creating damage, not flowing out into the world and being inspirational and, you know, playing with the world. It's just damaging your organ. Yeah, uh, uh, Eileen McCusick, to... we've had on, she talks about uh, the biofield or biosphere and, and has shown through her studies, the great effect sound has on that, right? But it yeah. is interesting with the vortexing, that vortexing, you know, there's un, a lot of esoteric schools talk about how the heart is the direct connection to the divine, right? Of course, that's a, a general concept in spirituality. And in your book, Human Heart Cosmic 
uh, or human heart, cosmic heart, which is great. Uh, I remember when Bear first told me about this concept years ago, uh, and he told he actually said, "Go get Tom Cowan's book." And I did, and in this, and towards one of the last chapters, you bring up the idea of heart transplants, which is kind of crazy when you think about it. That modern science thinks that I mean, I guess we're saving a life, but what to what effect? And we're transferring someone else's conscious field, this vortexing field that's a direct probably connection to their noetic higher self that is their infinite, you know, conscious self into somebody else's biology. And we've seen, right, um, emotional and, and personality changes yeah. with people who have heart transplants. Yeah. And sometimes they even, you know, there's the story about like the 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 racist guy who uh, gets a heart transplant um, from some young African-American guy who was shot. And next thing you know, he's starting to like music for the first time. Never had, never hated music. Uh, <laughs> but then he starts, he said, no, this can't be, you know, but because then he starts liking classical music. But, you know, he's this like redneck guy. Yeah. So he never had, he never listened to clap. And his wife is like, and he can suddenly dance for the first time, you know, like the guy never danced or listened. And the argument that they used uh, that it, it couldn't be that because this young African-American guy, he probably didn't like classical music, right? He was into rap and all. Turns out the guy was a young African-American guy, but he was on his way to his classical violin training that he did along with his rap music stuff. Uh, and so it was so specific like that, that you just shake your head and, and say, there's so much more going on here than we think. Also the fact that it didn't happen to everybody. And a lot of people uh, had the, I, I think you would say had the experience of resisting this new field that was in them. Like this guy actually, when he came to grips with it, he sort of did fine. <laughs> you know, he Embracing. started getting, going to dance clubs and he had a nice life for, the, for a while. Whereas some people say, no, that's not me, right? I'm rejecting that. And they actually often would physically reject their heart or they, they just wouldn't do well. So the moral of the story is, if you're going to do something as crazy as as that, you better go with it. Because if you don't, you're going to be in bigger trouble than you can imagine. <laughs> wow. Great. Yeah. And get a profile of what who the person is or the organ. Because, of course, in reductionist scientism, it's just an organ, right? Yeah, <laughs> it has nothing just to an do organ. with the personality that it came from or that that all the wonderful elements of that human being yeah. right um, yeah that is your field your personality that's you uh, and if you're going to do that you better have it you better be open to a new personality because that's what you've got so tom um i'm looking at these two websites here we've got um and we're sharing the uh, new biology curriculum, and this is for more geared towards practitioners, if I'm correct, right? Uh, yes. And that actually, guys, it's in the show notes below. You can go to alphavedic.com forward slash new biology to check that out and sign up. Tom's doing a number. You, you got scheduled a number of um, classes or workshops for that to, for people to essentially go through the process, right, of the education to then get your, your certi certification. Uh, for that. And then the second part here, which is really interesting, is then you have the clinic. And is the idea here with the clinic is once you get the certification and you start to get the know-how and start applying this, then you could be part of the clinic and be marketed as uh, a practitioner? Uh, no, the clinic is for people who feel like they want some help mm -hmm. and they sign up to be a, a, not a patient, but a member of the clinic and they talk to um to adam and they usually talk to pat who does movement that your friend mm -hmm. and they start on a you know a journey of you know regaining their health i got so it my my question was is this clinic going to grow 
as you're teaching all these people yes. and they're going to need an outlet for business, right? Like, yes. because it's, as we know with practitioners, I'm talking to Biggelsons, for instance, and they, they won't mind me saying this, they're exhausted trying to run their own clinic and their own business and doing it all themselves. They just want to do the work, right? Yeah. They want to get the patients to do the work, not deal with the marketing, the branding, yeah. you know, all that infrastructure stuff. And right. So just, just to, I was just going to say, just to clarify on the Biggelsons, they are not practicing in any way. They are uh, doing a different kind of consulting. They don't cross any boundaries that they're not supposed yeah. to. Uh, and they're also trying to keep their dad's work alive. So um, anyway, Tom, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, but that's the same. We're, we're not doing medicine. We're consulting mm -hmm. with people and help being partners with them on their journey. And right. yes, we're hoping uh, that there's more and more of these as the need arise and the people who feel like they're ready to do a practice based on these, quote, new biology principles. Amazing. Well, guys, Fantastic. if this is piquing your interest, let's say you're a chiropractor or a traditional Chinese um, medicine practitioner and want to get more tools on your tool belt, this sounds like an amazing opportunity. So go to alphabetic.com forward slash new biology. I know Bear, it, you're, you're, as you say, uh, someone practicing in the healing arts uh, is always learning, right? It never ends until the that's day for you, sure. you pass. Uh, and that's what the traditional physician mentality was supposed to be. Somehow that got converted into just going to pharmaceutical conventions and dinners and learning what the new drug of the day was. <laughs> Not so much. Yeah. Listen to your quote, patience. I, almost everything I learned, somebody told me this is what I did. And I don't know how many times, sure you've heard this bear. Somebody says, yeah, you know, I had lupus and I went, I drank urine or I smeared dog poop on me and it got better. And I went to my doctor and I told him and he said, oh, that's not possible. I don't want to hear anything about this. And if somebody says yeah. I drank horse urine and my lupus got better, I'd say, where'd you get the horse and how much did you drink? <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I guess... I don't know if it's true or not, but I want to know the details. Like, how did you do this? And then I go look it up and see if I can find anybody else who did that. That is the only way to learn this stuff. If you're so arrogant that you no, I didn't learn that. That can't be. You're 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 done. Or when the immediate response is, oh, that's just placebo. I, yeah, you right. know, my thoughts are, well, that's great. Let's see how placebo works. That might yeah. be the answer to everything. Yeah. Or anecdotal. As if yeah. that's, if it's, it's your experience means nothing. Right. So I don't mm -hmm. want to hear about it. It's science. And then you go looking at what they call science and it's BS mostly. Religion. It's the new religion. <laughs> religion. It's the religion of the day. Well, it's hey, a Tom, belief system. It is. Uh, Tom, any final thing you want to cover before we just, let you go? Just really thank you guys. You guys are doing some great stuff. Uh, my wife orders from you all the time. We have all kind of <laughs> alpha Vedic stuff all over the place. Uh, so, yeah, it's just great to be with you guys and appreciate all you're doing. Well, thank you for that, Tom. And uh, this has been great fun. We had to do it more often and yeah. keep up your marvelous work and uh, love to meet you in the flesh someday. Yeah, we will. All right, awesome. guys. Thanks, Tom. Hey, thanks everybody in the chat. It was a lively chat today. Thanks for all the support. Please go support Tom and all his endeavors by his books. Go to his website. Uh, check him out on the end of COVID. Uh, he's uh, on a couple sessions, I believe, with Andrew Kaufman. But the thing that's going to be really exciting is July 31st, his talk on um, uh, new biology, uh, I believe it's, uh, excuse me, July 30th, the new cell biology, kind of a bit what we yeah. covered today, but that's his entire presentation will be uh, dropping on the end of COVID. You can go watch that for free. Uh, sign up if you haven't already. Uh, and thank you guys. Love you. Remember to get outside, get your feet in the dirt, go plant something, start a garden. If you haven't already, go for a hike. Go hug a tree. Mother Nature's our best teacher. Go show her some love. And uh, we'll see you next week with a big one, Marsha Ann. We're bringing her out to the world. Oh, How to go to the private, private trusts, all that good law stuff we know you guys love, which is just as crucial as what we talked about today. Love you guys. Have a great weekend. Peace.
Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Bye-bye.